Welcome back. In this segment, I'm going to speak more about grammar. Uh, this particular segment is aimed more at ESL speakers of English. That, that's not really a trendy term anymore in linguistics. But what I mean is people who have not grown up with a native ability to speak English. They've learned English in school, at home, on the street, uh, wherever they've learned it, but it is not their normal language used at home. And in particular, I'm going to speak about Korean students, because this video segment is aimed, is aimed at my Korean students. Uh, it does not mean that what I'm going to speak about is worthless if you are a native speaker. Uh, hopefully there is going to be some information in here that will help you understand somewhat of how your language works. Uh, I often use the car analogy with, with language, that we get in a car and we drive it, and we don't really think about how the car works. Uh, you're going to be in a much better position of using your car to the fullest if you have at least a basic understanding of the parts and the functions that go, to me that go together to make the car work. How do the brakes work? How does the engine work? Uh, so, grammar is the engine of English, and we're going to learn more about it today. But again, I'm going to tailor my discussion much more specifically to those unique problems that, that Korean students have in learning English. Uh, again, English is a difficult language, and I feel some sympathy for people who are trying to learn this crazy language. I didn't invent it. Uh, I always say, and I've said in previous segments, English is not a difficult language to understand the basics of, but understanding all of the strange exceptions and variations on English, uh, admittedly, they are very difficult. And I'm going to help you with some of those aspects today, and we'll try to, uh, we'll try to slay as many dragons as we can. Now, when I speak of these unique difficulties that uh, speakers of other languages have in learning English, uh, the, term, the term that I think linguistics would generally use is language interference. What I mean by that is that it's natural for a Korean speaker to write a sentence or to think of an English sentence using Korean logic or Korean grammar. Uh, Korean sentences, for those of you who don't know anything about Korean as a language, uh, Korean sentences tend to have a different word order in English. Uh, sentences can be reversed. Uh, the, way that, the way that Korean would make complex sentences, the, the way that Korean would formulate a sentence, they're all different. And uh, I guess the easiest way for me to explain the difference between Korean and English is that Korean is a high context language English is a low-context language. That is not a value judgment. That doesn't mean that one language is better than another. It means that they are different. Uh, what do I mean by a high-context language? All right, well, this is something I've noticed about speakers of Korean. They have a conversation. What time is it? It's almost noon. I wonder what they're having in the cafeteria today. Boy, they had something nice yesterday for lunch. I'm hungry. Uh, a Korean conversation would establish a context. And at that point in Korean, uh, literally, you just need to say stomach empty, begopa. Uh, that's all you need to do to say I'm hungry in Korean. Uh, literally, you're saying stomach empty. Now, the context is clear because you've just been talking about food for a few sentences. In English, you walk into a room and say, stomach empty, and they're going to laugh at you and lock you away, uh, because it doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't really need to establish a context so much in English. You could just say, I'm hungry, and it would make perfect sense, uh, because English is a low-context language. And uh, for many Koreans, they find this uh, English obsession with pronouns curious, English or Korean sentences generally use very few pronouns. Uh, English insists on it. Uh, that's one aspect of the high context, low context difference. Again, in uh, English, you could walk into a room and say, I'm going to the beach.
in Korean, you would not need to say that. Uh, there's a way of saying I, but you don't normally need to say it. You could just say beach go. And uh, literally, you're saying beach go, and then that's enough. And uh, if you told a Korean, well, I don't understand what you mean, who's going to the beach, uh, a Korean might look at you and say, are, are, are you stupid? I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a bathing suit and I have a, a blanket over my shoulder. Uh, obviously, um, it's me who's going to the beach and, and not the person sitting in, on the other side of the room. So uh, Koreans can take some of these things for granted because a context has already been established. In English, you can't do that. So, uh, the lesson that you should learn if you're a Korean speaker is that when you are writing in English, you must be obvious. You must be very clear and very specific on who you're talking about and what you're talking about. Uh, sometimes when my wife is having a conversation with other Korean speakers, they can go on for sentences and sentences without ever explicitly saying, who they're talking about, because it's not necessary in the language. You can simply omit that pronoun. Uh, you can't do that in English. If you say too many things, if you have too many sentences with he, he, he in them, without ever saying who the he is, without giving uh, a name to the pronoun, people can get confused very quickly. This is particularly so in academic writing, where you just have a piece of paper and some of these contextual markers are not clear. So, I'm going to say again, when you're writing in English, this is a rule of thumb. Be obvious. I once had a student when I taught, I taught a, a teacher's training program, and the students lived in a dormitory on campus. Uh, a girl came to class, and, and I said, where is your roommate? Uh, my, the student said, oh, he's sick. I looked a little strange at her and said, uh, how could your roommate be a male? You, 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 this is not a co-ed dormitory, this is Korea, it's a conservative country. Uh, obviously your roommate is, is, a, is a woman. And, and this uh, student looked at me for a little bit and probably thought I was very foolish. And she said, okay, well I, I, I said he by accident, but obviously I meant she. Uh, but that's the, the way the English brain is, is wired. We, we are used to hearing the correct pronoun. We get confused very quickly by things that seem to a Korean speaker to be blindingly obvious. Okay, now this is one reason why when you write something in Korean, you type it into a, a Google Translator and convert it into English, uh, it's gibberish. It doesn't mean anything uh, because that essential information that is in an English sentence is missing. Now, Korean does have particle markers indicating relationships such as prepositions. Uh, there are other indications uh, in a Korean sentence. Uh, when you machine translate them, they're gone. And, and to an English speaker, this sentence is meaningless. Okay, really what I want to talk about in this lecture is four basic categorical areas that Koreans have particular problems with. And we're going to go after the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we're going to go after the basic things that will hopefully make your life a lot easier if you can master them. The first thing I'm going to talk about is articles. That is probably the biggest problem that Koreans have when writing or even speaking in English. It's using a and the. Now, I know the reason why a and the are so particularly maddening for Korean speakers. It's because Korean does not have any equivalent of a and the. Uh, again, that's not a value judgment. Uh, or ancient English, what we call Old English, did not really have articles either. Uh, Latin did not have them. Many modern languages do not have a and the. Uh, Russian, the language spoken in the Philippines, Tagalog, uh, many modern languages get along just fine without articles. Chinese languages such as this, no articles. Um, English has them. Most of the modern Romance languages have them. Uh, Arabic has them. Uh, for example, you, words such as, well, 
al-Qaeda, the terrorist organization, the cause. The al is a, is a definite article. Uh, alchemy, the uh, word that became modern chemistry, uh, reflects the Arab influence in engineering and the sciences. Oddly enough, our word alcohol is Arabic. Uh, funny coming from a culture that generally does not drink. But uh, that's where it's from. Uh, at any rate, uh, I understand that for Korean speakers, a and the are difficult because they're not, they're not a part of the language. And I suppose it's like me learning uh, a Martian language where I need to indicate whether the speaker is left-handed or right-handed. I, I might think, well, that's very foolish. Why do we need this? Uh, but it's essential in English because, again, the context doesn't really make things clear. Uh, the language and the words used are essential to make things understandable to the, uh, the reader or the audience. Okay. Um, okay. I've taught a and the to Korean students for many years, and I've never really been convinced that the way I teach them a and the helps them, or that what they learn in textbooks really helps them. And I think one thing that might help make a and the much more easily understood for a Korean speaker is to think visually. A and the are essentially and etymologically visual words of indication. And for this, let's go back to Old English a little bit. Where did a and the come from? Uh, a comes from the Anglo-Saxon word an, which simply means one, the comes, well, comes indirectly from the Anglo-Saxon words the and that. Uh, those characters you're seeing there are not part of English anymore. They are alphabetic letters that have dropped out of the language centuries ago. Uh, they mean th now. Uh, Korean also has this and that. We have ibosa and that, or chobosa, uh, this and that. Uh, but English, a thousand years ago, had equivalent words, uh, this and that. Now, those words descended into modern the. They became more precise, and they split off from that. Uh, in the same way, I'm not sure if this historical linguistics lesson is useful, uh, the Romance languages did the same thing. Uh, what we call vulgar Latin, had a demonstrative called ile and ila. Uh, classical Latin didn't really use those words so much, but they are a part of what we call church Latin. Uh, they are ila and ila, male and female, that. And what happened is that they became in Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, am I missing one, French, uh, they became modern il, el, la, Okay, they're all definite articles in those respective languages. Uh, the same thing happened in English. We get the. So uh, why did we get that word? Uh, again, it's a visual word. It's a word that you point with. That's one thing that might help you remember when to use the. It's a pointing word. Okay, uh, a not so much, but think of a in this respect. Uh, if you remember that a at one time literally meant one, uh, perhaps that helps you understand logically what we mean when we use a and an. Uh, one thing. Okay, let's reach for our marker here. Uh, I have a marker. Well, what do I mean logically by saying a marker? Well, I mean I have one marker. Uh, it is one out of a group. There's a million other markers in the world. What's so special about this marker? Do I uh, hold it tight at night? Uh, no, I don't. It, it's just a marker, and it's one out of a group. It's one out of many. Uh, it's one example out of many others. So now we understand the function of a, or an, when a vowel sound follows. How does this fit into the big picture? Sometimes there is no article before a noun. Sometimes there is a or an. And sometimes there is the. To answer that, we need to continue this discussion in the next video clip.